Amigo Genovese, a founding member of the Legitimate Business Syndicate, organizers of Decathlon Capture the Flag, starting in 2013. Amigo's work includes building infrastructure for distributed software development, designing and building both cloud-based and on-site scoring systems for cybersecurity games and visual design. Let's hear it for Amigo. Hopefully I just fixed my collar. I made the terribly unwise decision of messing with it right before I talked. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about what I've learned writing Capture the Flag challenges. So when I talk about Capture the Flag or CTF, uh, it's a really, really broad category of game. Uh, originally, Capture the Flag was going into you know, some hostile territory and recovering an object for a flag of value for the game. Uh, mostly we work with computer security Capture the Flag games which are exactly the same, except we throw the word cyber around a lot more, and we use files instead. <coughs> the most popular form of computer-based capture the flag game is Jeopardy-style games. Uh, so up here behind me, we have a really small sample of the board, and I drew it instead of rendering it in HTML. So we have some categories. Each category has some challenges. Each challenge is worth some points. Uh, one of the challenges, the 200 in the shell code category, is on fire which means if you solve this challenge, you get control of the board, and you get to decide what challenge you unlock next. It's just like Real Jeopardy, except the questions are a lot harder and a lot more open-ended. The other form that we're familiar with are attack-defense catch-the-fly games. These are complicated, so I'm going to explain the rules a little bit. So this is a game with uh, White Hatter Computer Security Club from USF here in Tampa against Hack UCF from here in Central Florida. For over that way, so <laughs> Is anybody from Hack UCF here like to you guys? I'm from both. Okay, look at this guy. Uh, and at the bottom, <laughs> and at the bottom, at the bottom we have the uh, scorebot. And the scorebot is not a player, it's the scoring system, the referee, the scorekeeper, etc. So at the beginning of the game, let's say both White Hatters and Hack UCF have one flag each. White Hatters then builds an attack or an exploit launches it against Hack UCF to try and see if they can steal a secret. They stole the secret successfully, and they get UCF's flag. However, that's not the whole game. There's this concept of defense and uptime. So the White Matters, in fixing their security issue, they introduced a new flaw in the way the program works. So every round, the scorebot sends out these tests to make sure the service still works as intended. And white hackers, because of their bug, have failed this test. While well, Hack UCF passed the test. And white hackers lose his flags to Hack UCF because they were down or not working correctly, and UCF was. So that's a very high level overview. Uh, you can spend hours debating scores like we have in our secret lab. Uh, but that's not. So we run our game, our attack defense game, here at DEF CON. Uh, so this is DEF CON 2015, I think. Uh, back when the first year we were in Valleys. Uh, it's a huge crowd. I think the whole conference has like 20,000 people attending now. It's spread over a weekend. If you can trick your boss into paying for Black Hat Vegas, you just pay the extra to like 200 bucks to do DEF CON over the weekend and get trapped. I mean, learn lots of valuable skills. <laughs> At DEF CON in 2016, they hosted the Cyber Grand Challenge. Uh, so this was a computer hacking contest sponsored by DARPA. It took the form of a very specific flavor of Capture the Flag game, and it was played entirely by, by autonomous computers. So there were humans involved. They had spent years building the software that runs on these computers to automatically hack software. And then they had to spend the whole game in a pen filled with couches and beverages and news crews and not actually hack any software themselves. There was a big air gap around the stage. It was a really slick production. Uh, you should have been there. So the way the uh, CDC works is much like your regular attack defense game. You have a game server that's keeping score, you have a cyber reasoning system, or CRS, and you have another cyber reasoning system. And each CRS, think of it as a team. So CRSs ask the game server for challenge sets. At the beginning of the game, every team has the same challenge binaries in a challenge set. 
Uh, so they download the CRS's gravity's binaries, and the CRS is then able to upload new patched C, uh, challenge binaries that don't have a vulnerability, and they're also able to upload a proof of vulnerability or POV that demonstrates a vulnerability against another team. Uh, think of POV as an exploit, just you know, made friendly so you can get government money. <laughs> CRSs look like this. Uh, there are a huge rack of servers, and that label on the side that says CRS was a big cooling thing that sent like hot water out to a truck in the parking lot that cooled it off. Uh, it was really slick. Uh, one of my favorite parts of CGC was it gave us a lot of really, really good jargon, like a cyber reasoning system, which is a computer that plays CTF on its own. Proof of vulnerability is kind of an exploit, but it's more of a, feels more scientific. Uh, proofs of vulnerability also have a very specific structure. They're a particular subset of uh, C program. Replacement binaries are, you know, a patched binary, and challenge binaries are mostly what this talk about is about. So I have a challenge binary for you called Besties, uh, BST for uh, B sides Tampa. So if you go to besties.notmalware.ru, <laughs> totally told legit. BS was the second best name of this talk. Uh, you can download this file, uh, you can hack it. I actually do have a prize for the first uh, person today to give me the answer to this binary. Uh, so spend some time if you want to solve it, but also please pay attention to talks and tip your waiters. <laughs> so what is a CTF challenge anyways? A uh, CTF challenge is a computer thing that teams attack, and it should protect something of in-game value. Uh, we mostly run CTFs with binary files because that's what we mostly run CTFs with, so you get that nasty habit. A uh, CTF challenge should be known solvable. It's bad form to put something up for players to solve and say, is this exploitable? I don't know, you tell me. Uh, because running a CTF is a lot of customer support. Ideally, a challenge binary should be appropriately tricky as well. And I'll go into why more. So some challenges seem insurmountably hard. Like, whenever I play a CTF game, most challenges are like this huge brick wall that's blue for some incomprehensible reason. Uh, it's a brick wall protecting the flag, and I know I have like no chance on solving it. Whenever other people play CTS, uh, people that are good at CTS, they see a challenge that would be a big blue brick wall for me as a little yellow speed bump, and they can solve a challenge in like 20 minutes. It's kind of embarrassing. So what, what does solving a challenge even mean? It usually means trying to figure out how some piece of software works and what input you need to maybe get it to the correct side of an if statement that makes it print out you want. That's it. Uh, it may involve cracking a code, like breaking a cipher. It may involve using SQL injection into tricking a database or website powered by a database into making you an administrator so you can read private messages. It may involve stealing the garbage file from the Gibson if you're in a movie and where all the at work. <laughs> so how do we actually build a CTF challenge? So I'm going to be talking mostly about a challenge from last year's DEF CON qualifiers called Thousand Cuts. Uh, and it may or may not be named as the level in Borderlands 2. So our original goal was to get teams to get in the habit of writing a cyber reasoning system, but a simple one. And the reasoning for that is in 2015, we announced that our 2016 finals game would work with computers that run the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge, uh, which would mean we have to build this game in a way that would be interesting for a computer that can solve binaries quickly, but not intuitively necessarily. The game would have to be possible for a computer to play, which would mean that we would have challenges that would be easy for a computer to take apart, even if a lot of our teams were not, you know, made of computers or made with people that were competing in CGC. So we wanted to push teams into building a uh, cyber reasoning system. Uh, we also wanted them to get used to dealing with a CGC binary, or CGC executable format. So uh, Linux, BSD, and I think Solaris, or what's left of Solaris, uh, joint smart OS, uh, can all run ELF binaries. ELF binaries have a like ELF magic number at the top. They have a file header, which is a table of contents to all these different sections, which have section headers. CGC binaries are almost exactly the same, except the magic number is different, and like I think one of the sections has a different number. But CGC binaries also have another really, really useful property. They, they can only make like a half dozen different syscalls. Like they can't get random numbers 
Uh, they're designed to really be really, really easy to analyze. So given the same standard in and the same initial state, they will produce the same standard output, the same standard error output, they'll run in the same number of clock cycles and make the same syscalls every time. Uh, this is really, really valuable for a you know, computer that's trying to constraint solve it because it doesn't have to worry that some function or some syscall will return different stuff in different cases. Uh, if anybody here is like a functional programming nerd, I like to think of a CGC binary as a pure function. Well, it, it has, do, you, do you count standard out as a side effect or do you, or do you count it as a return value? And that's the question. Uh, so why do we get people to automate things? Uh, or how are we going to get teams to automate things? We have to make sure that the theory side of this graph, where automating stuff is a big spike of work that saves you a lot of time as things go on, pays off. Uh, the reality means, yeah, lots of debugging. Uh, that's why the teams were given a year to write CRSs, not 48 hours. And the way we do this is by, if a team gets one single binary, they're going to put like a really smart guy on it, and they'll solve it in a few minutes, and that'll be that. If you give them a pile of a thousand binaries, they're going to start to want to automate it. So a thousand cuts was just a collection of very, very simple buffer overflow attacks, or buffer overflow vulnerabilities with stack cookies. So on the stack in our memory, we have a buffer on the far left, then we have a stack cookie that's checked against the static value in the binary. Then we have our 32 bit registers, EIP, ESP, uh, EBX, those are the only register names I remember this morning when I made this slide. And teams have to pro provide input that goes past the end of the buffer. Uh, I use A's here because everybody always uses A's. They have to match the kind of cookie, which is uh, chocolate chip, <coughs> the best cookie. And then they want to clobber EIP, ESP, etc., so it all crashes. Normally when software crashes, you get sad. In this case, teams got happy because that was the goal. So because I wanted to split this into multiple like instances of challenges to give teams some ramping up and let teams that give something give them something easy and then medium and then harsh. So in each set, I had about 333 individual binaries, and I named them after theoretical sandwiches because that's funny. Uh, at any time, teams could connect. And they would get, well, teams would first download like a big file with hundreds of binaries in it. They'd connect to the service that would say, give me a string that will crash this binary uh, and base 64 encode it to prevent weird network stuff from happening. Uh, they would solve that. They would say, OK, that crashed. Do this binary next. And if they could crash 10 of these random binaries successfully, they'd get the flag in there. And this is what a theoretical sandwich is. Uh, it's a uh, bread. I, made a list of different breads from around the world, different sauces from around the world, and different sausages from around the world. Uh, so some of the sandwiches were real, and you could eat them. Most of them are theoretical. Uh, so with this all written down in like three huge CSVs of uh, bread, sauces, and sausages, I had to actually build the challenge. So this is just a normal building software process. I used the service template. Instead of running like Rails new service name, I would copy the CGC service template. I would write a test that made sure it didn't crash whenever provided with input that shouldn't crash it. And then I made a binary that passed the test. Then I wrote another test that should crash it and made a binary that crashed. Uh, steps four and five, they look really small there. That part took me about a day because I'm not good at binaries. And I'm gradually improving at my GDB skills. So with those five steps, I've got the first of 334 binaries done. Uh, after that, that one only took me about two days, so given like two years, I could get all these binaries done. Uh, instead, I wrote a Ruby, Ruby script. It varied the buffer sizes and the stack cookie just to make things easy. And I made a Python script that would do this game flow. Make prompt you for 10 different binaries, collect the input, see if it crashed. Once that was out of the way, I tried to figure out what would make the second and third sets more difficult and how to do that. So for the second set, what I wanted to do was I believed that the, the magic number or the, the, stack, the stack buffer sizes and the cookie that were being checked were at the same spot in the binary. And I didn't want people to just 
you know, write a script, read this thing from this part of the binary, read this thing from this part of the binary, and use that to generate the crash string. What I wanted was for teams to have to actually do something that dealt with the compiled code or the assembly code. So I had to step to the source code to scoot stuff around in the file and chain, like make teams have to actually write a cyber reasoning system and not a Perl script that reads from the file. For the third set, I did the same thing, but also changed the order of stuff in the file in the weird belief that it would actually make it a lot harder. So with that out of the way, I had to test the difficulty, uh, which, mean, which meant I grabbed Rhino because I was hanging out in his house at the time, uh, as well does. So he finds a bug within like 30 seconds that always crashes the binary without having to understand it, uh, because that's what he does. He's a professional software crasher. So fixing the bug took me 30 minutes because I asked him way too late. If I'd asked him early in the process, it would have taken five minutes. So after that, we talked about it some more, I passed it to another team member, and the verdict was that it was just kind of weird. Uh, instead of just directly connecting to a binary and crashing it, you were connecting to a wrapper script, you were sending base64 stuff. If teams weren't expecting a CGC executable format, they'd have a lot of problems with this. And uh, spoiler as they did. So we made a fourth challenge out of this called Easy Prasky, where we just took this, a single binary uh, that was on a kind of, it was one of the sandwiches that was on a kind of bread called Bing, which is funny because of the search engine. And we put it in our category for easy challenges that we call Baby's Purse. Uh, so what this did was it separated the idea that you have to build a, C, a cyber reasoning system from, you have to get used to dealing with this weird executable format. So this is, I think it's like separation of concerns. It's a concept that Fred Brooks addresses in the mythical man model. And not every challenge has this separation of concerns thing, but I've gotten burned by not separating concerns and challenges previously, and I wanted to make it an easy uh, skill ramp, I guess. And in the second level for the 334 cuts, the easy Prasky binary was have to always be first. So teams would always get asked about something they need the answer for. After that, we just had to get it deployed uh, so it would run during the game. So we had to sit down and determine what ops requirements to have. So the CGC stuff requires a special Linux kernel, which we were already using, which was easy to set up then because I could just coast off everybody else's effort. Uh, in retrospect, that CGC kernel thing was kind of a pain. Uh, we host on Amazon AWS uh, EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, and it doesn't like running 32-bit Linux. Like, they're a business, I get it, they have to upgrade computers to ones that people buy, so they just have dwindling quantities of these old computers that can run CGC stuff. Uh, besides that, we needed Python installed to make the wrapper script work and to open a firewall port. So once we knew these requirements, I sat down, learned how to write Puppet modules, and as part of the process for the Puppet modules, I dumped 5,000 files in Git. The 5,000, or the 1,000 binaries, and then all these support files, like this is the input that will crash it, this is the source code for it, et cetera. Uh, don't do this if the rest of your team is using the same Git repo, uh, because it's awful. Then game day, it, because of all this prep work we had done and all the testing, it just kind of worked once teams got in the CDC executable format mode. Uh, we tried really hard to make that an easy thing to get into. Uh, a full year before the game, we announced that it was going to be using CGC architecture, and before our qualifiers game, we did a week or so worth of blog posts saying, here's what you need to know about CGC. Here's how you run a CGC binary. Here's how you run the uh, Vigor box. So what was the process I followed? We spent a lot of time ideating or making a design for the challenge. We built the challenge, and then we did acceptance testing on the challenge. This is just a waterfall software development process. We use a CTF challenge framework. So instead of just writing a bunch of code, we use a framework that gave us configuration system. It gave us a build system, you know, a make file. It gave us a testing environment. We could test to see if a specific input would crash it. And we didn't use the part to test to see if specific inputs worked because we didn't care. It gave us a good way to deploy it. Run it on this version of the Linux kernel, run it in this directory, et cetera. We use CGC service template, but it basically provides the same features that like Rails or Django or Elixir games provide. It's a framework for building things. Deployment, that's 
you know, put it on a server. It's just software. That's all the CTF challenge is. It is the same goals as any other piece of software. Be useful, you know, solve some problem for somebody. Be usable, make it easy for people to solve their problems with it. And be reliable, make it so it works when people try and solve their problems with it. Am I going too fast for anybody? Because I feel like I'm going fast. <laughs> So what we like to do for our qualifiers game is separate our challenges into two categories. And this may be more of like an emotional separation on a, I can make a competition challenge, I can make an educational one. Uh, so for competition challenges, these have a very, very specific goal in mind. We want to be able to provide a separation between teams that are able to solve this challenge and teams that can't. For our finals game, we don't have a lot of space in there. We want it to be filled with good teams that solve lots of challenges. So we want to be able to correlate a team that does well in quals should be a team that does well in finals. And we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, the year that PPP didn't do super well in our qualifiers, they didn't win our finals. For educational challenges, and for a thousand cuts especially, what I want to do is to teach new players something and get them over a hang up. Before a thousand cuts, I would have never guessed that I could write a cyber reasoning system. And as part of my you know, building this challenge, making sure it was solvable, I did. And it was not as hard as I thought it was. So besides usefulness, we have to worry about usability. We want the difficulty of the challenge to only be the difficulty that we intended it to have. If it's hard because it's really timing sensitive, or because it checks like the serial number of your CPU to make sure it's running on my computer and not yours, that's obnoxious. And that's not the kind of difficulty we want. We want to minimize the corner for the unintended corner cases. And there's a big hanging question there about unintended vulnerabilities. So some challenges do have unintended vulnerabilities because they're software and people are really bad at writing software, uh, me especially. Uh, one of my challenges in I think 2013 was a web challenge that you had to uh, bit flip your way through a, an encrypted cookie in order to become admin. And what another team found was that in uh, URL get parameters, in Sinatra and in PHP and in older versions of Rails, if you put square brackets at the end of an argument, or a URL argument, certain parts of the stack will like not filter that out and say, this doesn't string match this thing you're worried about, so it's OK. But another part will flatten out all these array arguments into a single string. And long story short, the challenge that I thought would take a team half an hour took one team like a minute. So sometimes you have unintended vulnerabilities. Reliability is, perversely for CTF challenges, about continuing to be vulnerable. And it's really, really hard in a CTF game because it's getting attacked constantly. Some teams will think, oh, I can just hammer this, like, you know, DDoS this from a million servers and see if it breaks that way. Uh, Players like to root in limited cases. Uh, one of my challenges, I did a, I'm a sandwich enthusiast, I guess. And in 2014, I had a series of three challenges that were named after sandwiches. And just as like an incidental thing, one of the first things they spit out is a hello with a GUID. And what players were doing, like I was just making a GUID and throwing it out there for fun. A uh, GUID enthusiast too, I guess. And one of the teams spent an hour trying to like guess what the next GUID would be. And that was a separation concerns issue. Like, you know, face palm, it's like the GUID has nothing to do with it. And if I just made it a completely random GUID instead of like an incrementing time-based one, that wouldn't have been an issue. Uh, we also keep communication over with players because if a server goes down, that's the best way for us to find out. But on the other hand, Players always ask, like, oh, I've been working at this for an hour. Is this actually exploitable? And if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked, is this exploitable, there wouldn't be rye whiskey here, it would be scotch. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually why I just don't put scotch in flasks. <laughs> Reliability is demanding. It's not just demanding of your time. It's very emotionally demanding, and that's why I break it. So whenever something goes down, you feel like you're letting the players that want to use this service down. And it's, it's awful. Like you're sitting there, you're pulling your hair out. Like, 
Are there people on your team that are not having this issue or like doing something fun in the other room, like playing VR or something? And you feel like you're letting your team down because it's not just you that's in that room. Other people are dealing with IRC traffic and lots of griping about the service, figuring out what other gameplay stuff should be happening, while you're sitting there trying to fix a problem you created. And it's easy in any situation where like one person on a team does something wrong to get really, really hung up on fault and blame. Like, it's okay for me to say it's my fault, but it's it's awful when somebody else is saying, oh yeah, uh, you know, this is only your fault for doing this awful thing to the rest of us. And what you really, really need is not this fault and blame scenario. You need support from your team. So how do you get reliability? Uh, you can spend a lot of reli money on making reliable software. Uh, you could, like back in the day, you could buy servers with multiple CPUs that would keep together lockstep, and if something broke, you know, it would continue marching on. Like airplane equipment that's like mounted in threes because they can't just deal with a minority report, which is what movies made after. Uh, instead of doing that, spending a lot of money on it, you can instead build software that can be run reliably. And this is something that I really like to take from the big like web software industry. So there's this concept called a 12-factor app. It came from some people that work at Heroku, and I really, really like writing software for Heroku, and I really, really like this idea of these 12 factors. I'm not going to go through all 12, but my favorite two are concurrency and disposability. So the idea that whenever you want to make software handle more requests, you can either like, make it handle an individual request in less time, or you can just make it so it can handle more requests at a time. And that's really, really, it, you have to make some assumptions about what you're doing during each of these requests to let you parallelize it that way. The other thing I really like is this idea of disposability. You want a new instance of your service to be really, really quick to start up. And if you just kill the process or smash the server with an ax, you don't want it to leave the whole system in a bad state. So the way we do that is by limiting the amount of global state a challenge has to keep. Uh, so for example, for the thousand cuts challenges, there's no global state. Whenever somebody connects, they get a couple instance variables in a fresh Python process, and whenever they disconnect, the Python process gets killed by X I N D, which I love a lot. Uh, it makes adding resources cheap. Whenever we needed to, if we need to spin up a new instance of a server, we provision it. Like we ask EC2 to give me a new server. We tell Puppet install all this stuff on this server, and then we tell our DNS provider put the server, like put this IP address on this domain name. And the key to all that is automation. Don't say, oh, I'm going to work it and I'm going to handle this server and I'll automate it later. It's so much easier if you automate from the beginning. Uh, so if you're provisioning servers ever, get in the habit and get the knowledge to use Puppet or Chef or some other tool that lets you keep your server configuration in version control and just say, make a new server over here with that or make a new bigger image running this stuff. For a lot of our 2016 challenges, we used uh, Linux containers to isolate them from other processes on the same system. Uh, Docker is a wonderful tool for using these containers or for building and configuring these containers, except it's slow to start up because it does a lot of clever stuff, like clever useful stuff with the network, but wasn't super useful in our case. Uh, so run C is the command that Docker actually calls before it spools up all the network nonsense, and it's pretty fast. It's excellent. So for shared state, sometimes you do have to have shared state, like keeping a process per connection that doesn't talk to anything else doesn't always work. Um, like 2014 sandwich challenges, because instead of using like fast C, I wanted to do like elliptic curves in one of them, which means like the C libraries for that were not what I wanted to deal with. I wanted to use Ruby libraries for it. So I used JRuby, the Java implementation of Ruby that has great performance after it's been running for about five minutes and celluloid, which provides good threading support. Uh, so once it got started, and once it got rolling, it's super, super fast. And keeping the state per connection, but the server is still running the whole time, did work in this case. But sometimes you can't just do you know, state per connection. Sometimes you want global shared state. So web challenges are like the you know, global shared state thing. If you have a challenge with persistent cross-site scripting, what you basically have to do is now you have to talk to a database. 
And this database, you want it to be global in case your AnyCast DNS sends something to a different data center. Uh, and I don't go into any cast DNS at all. It's magic as far as I know. So one of my 2015 challenges was called Waiting for Your Touch. Uh, it's named after the Internet Explorer commercial. Uh, so 2014, 2015 or so, I think maybe it was April Fool's Day 2015, there was a subreddit called The Button. And it was a button that had a timer counting down from 60 seconds. And whenever anybody in the world pressed the button, it would reset the timer. And people in the subreddit would, you can only press the button once ever per account. And your account had to be created before the button was created. So what people would do is they would wait for the button to count down. Because if you click the button at 5 seconds, it was cooler than if you clicked it at 59 seconds. Uh, and people talked about like, oh yeah, purple people that clicked it under 30 seconds are cooler than green people or blue people. Uh, because you need some way to isolate yourself from other people for reasons I don't know. Uh, the point is, it was a really, really complex challenge. It used JRuby again because it was a Rails thing, and CRuby doesn't do threading super well. And I needed threading because I was using WebSockets. So everybody that connected would get a persistent TCP connection between their web browser and between the server uh, running in the cloud. And it used Postgres to manage the state of the. Uh, so it looked kind of like this. And there's an issue here on the right side of the diagram. As soon as this challenge went live, it quit being waiting for your touch and it started being waiting for the challenge. Uh, it would be slow when it wasn't a slow 500 error. Thankfully, it was during the day when I was awake and not, you know, not awake. So what we did was we took it down. Uh, a challenge that doesn't work isn't fun and nobody's going to, you know, want to deal with this solving it. We opened a replacement challenge and I started debugging it. So debugging for your touch involved just doing a lot of research, watching how it behaved, running like 30 browsers on my computer, uh, which made the fan spin up, which is you know, also stressful. I did eventually find that it was leaking and exhausting the Postgres connections. The Postgres servers we're using only let you have like 20 connections going at once. So I fixed the leak, or I made some fixes that I hoped would target the leak, and just bought more connection allocations. Uh, this process took about an hour. And like I'm sitting there literally pulling my hair out, and I'm like, I think this works. And Gino says, okay, stop what you're doing, get up, walk, you know, go walk around, drink some water, and then you'll be able to say, instead of is it fixed, you'll be able to say, it is fixed. So once we did that, we reopened it, and no more complaints. And the reason that was stressful, the reason that was hard for me to do, is because you know I'm not in this game to write programs. I'm in this code to make you know a fun game for people to play. And we have to respect people, and we have to respect everybody involved in the game. You have to you know look out for number one yourself. You have to respect the rest of your team, and you have to respect the people that are playing the CTF. So respect for yourself. You have to eat. You have to hydrate. You have to sleep. If you don't eat and if you aren't drinking enough, you'll get like progressively, progressively worse. You know, you'll get like lose control of your emotions, you'll be terrible to the rest of your team, you'll be terrible to the players, and you'll make bad decisions. So hydrate, and that's, you know, balloon, that's water. That's, you know, not this stuff. It's very bad for your brain. Uh, I will say, though, that I have had the, like, one of the best cups of coffee in my life was during our 2015 game. Or no, it was our 2016 game. It was coffee that I roasted at home, uh, good hobby a week prior, and I just made it and got this like terrible cheap drip machine. And I don't know if it had like aged to have the right flavor bouquet. I don't know if it was just stress. It was oh. I felt like what's his name in uh, the Twin Peaks. Like, oh that's a good coffee, the FBI agent. If your brain doesn't get what it needs, you're gonna be awful and things are gonna break and you're not gonna be able to deal with it. And at the end of the day, like, if I don't keep bringing up how awful waiting for your touch the challenge was, nobody else would either. They're going to remember, you know, the good parts of that game. You have to respect the rest of your team. Like, not everything is going to be going okay for your team the whole time. You know, some people are going to be having a bad time. In our 2015 finals, we had a whole series of services that just would not run correctly. And, you know, the team member responsible for them was beating themselves up. And 
you know, I just have to make sure it's like, I'm here for you. Do you need any water? Do you need me to get you a taco, uh, a hard shell taco in this case? Do you need any non-water beverages? And that helps a lot. You also have to respect the members of your team that work on infrastructure. So if you put 5,000 files in a Git repo, or if you put like a like five gigabyte file in a Git repo, like that's not just you standing up there jumping on these files to make them fit into your Git. That's going to be like anybody else owning this repo, maybe over in-flight Wi-Fi. That's going to be them, like you know, angry. Make services easy for your infrastructure team to keep running. So for my thousand cut services, I sat down and I wrote good documentation for it. You know, I provided, you know, here's how the service starts. It loads from this environment variable. Uh, it'll do things from this environment variable. If you want to back off the timeout, here's what you do. Uh, there's a great presentation, and I don't have the link in the slides, called Practicalities of Productionizing Distributed Systems by Jeff Hodges. And it's about all these things for making a network service that works with a team that has to keep it running. Provide easy to run smoke tests for your service. You know, is this exploitable? Should it not be a give me five minutes and I'll tell you yes after running this laborious series of tests. You should switch to the terminal, get up and enter, and it should spit out the current flag. Like that's that's what players need to know. It's like, yep, yeah, my script still works. It's you know the flag is still there, and that flag still works in the scoreboard. And you have to respect players. So players are, as a like for the most part, giving up their weekend to play your game, and you need to make them have fun. Computer hacking is an inherently fun activity. I'm assuming that's why we're all here on a Saturday. And at DEF CON, we aren't just competing with the option of not playing in a CTF. We're competing with every other thing that people can be doing at DEF CON, and not just during the day. If they say, ah, the CTF's boring now, uh, we're a team that's just going to be out all night drinking, so that whenever you're like leaving your hotel tower in the morning, uh, we're still at the hotel bar, and we are demolished. That's not a hypothetical. That's a thing that happened in 2014. I'm not going to shame it to you too much. Uh, you know, we compete with staying up all night drinking in another country. It's hard. We have players that are competing from all over the world, coming in from all over the world to play in our game. We have to make sure that we do things that make sense within the game. We can't just, you know, assume that there are so many IRL readers that know obscure memes. You know, we have to make sure that the game makes sense for somebody whose first language isn't English, or for somebody who may not know English at all. For our online game, we have to make sure it works for players with internet connections of all flavor. So, who here has like, you know, 100 megabit fiber in their house? So I'm a bad person if I make a challenge that requires, you know, a gigabit uplink to the internet. Um, we want to make challenges that work for players that are, you know, on a flip phone, like 3G network that goes to a, you know, tin cans and string before it gets to the cloud. Uh, we had a challenge in 2013 called Die Hard that was really, really tiny sensitive, and this only really surfaced during the game. And our solution was to tell teams, like. Oh, just go rent a server in US East 1 because that's, you know, a cop out. Make unique services. It's, it's easy and it's okay to make a service that's, you know, a rebranded service or a historical service, but doing new, exciting, weird stuff is so much fun. Why don't you take this opportunity to do it? So in 2014, we built a hardware bags that I neglected to bring with me that ran a chat service on a custom like CDMA wireless network that we built. Uh, that's cool. Like, teams had a lot of fun with that, even if there uh, was a terrible bug in the service that made uh, PVP not able to score on. They stole money, so they could deal with it. Uh, but it's okay to reuse and remix a service. So the bug for this Badger service that showed up for the Gus Solved in 2014, we fixed that bug and we ported the service from MSP 4.3 to x86 and uh, x11 and made a service in our 2016 qualifiers, uh, which was fun. And we got a lot of good comments about it. We tricked a lot of people into opening up their x11 ports to the public internet, which was a terrible idea because so we could launch x on their machines to watch their first trip beat them out. 
So that's the basics of and how building CTF challenges is like building regular software. You know, a software product. You want it to be useful, usable, and reliable. Reliability is imposing a lot of constraints on what you want to do. Limit the amount of state you store. Limit the dependencies that your software has on external services, and automate the way you run. Respect is fundamental. You wouldn't be building a CTF if you don't respect the people playing it. Respect yourself, take care of yourself, you know, stay hydrated, stay well fed, uh, eat and drink healthy things. Respect your team, provide emotional support when you don't need to provide technical support. And respect your players, they're giving up their time to play your game. And with that, I'm open for any questions, and if nobody asks me a question in about 30 seconds, I've got some questions ready to answer. <laughs> Okay, so the first seated question that somebody asked me earlier today is about our game in particular. And the question is, why do you think CTS keep getting harder? Uh, so we, we won't lie, we make you know, one of the hardest CTS around. It's all binary challenges and files, and it's because our players are you know, really, really good. Uh, the team that won our game in finals this year, PPP, the Carnegie Mellon team, this was, like they won our game, within like two days of them winning three million dollars at CGC. And if we don't provide hard challenges, so much of the game comes just down to execution of how well you're able to score things and how quickly you're able to patch, versus are you able to make this new breakthrough in software that's never been reverse engineered before. So we make a hard CTF because some of our players want a hard CTF. And what I have a problem with and what I don't have a great solution for, is that that lets down every player that's not PPP level. Like people like me, I, I solved like two challenges for our CTF ever that I didn't write. And one of them was last year. Uh, I just wanted a new package of software to do it to make this challenge that would have taken me like a week, to make it take like three hours instead. So what we need to do better, and what I'm not sure we're going to be able to do better this year, is to make more challenges that are easy, that are still like semi fun or a good warm up for people on you know more advanced teams. Uh, that said, there's a lot of room for easier, more CTF games. If you want to run a CTF game, don't just watch a bunch of YouTubes about it, uh, like I'll recommend you do, because uh, I made a YouTube about it. But you know, <laughs> you only run a CTF game. It doesn't have to be for a huge worldwide audience. Run it for some local friends. Figure out if you can run it at like a weekly or monthly hacker meetup or something. So that's why I think that our game is so hard, but it probably shouldn't be. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, well, uh, thanks everybody for your attention. If you have other questions, you can contact me up here or at the uh, happy hour that will be coming up in about one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, thanks for your attention and have a good afternoon.